The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. My name is Mark Levine, and I am the Deputy Director of the New York State Association of Counties. On behalf of our President, Jack Marin from Ontario County, and our Executive Director, Stephen Aquario, I wanna thank you for joining us this morning for a webinar designed to discuss some of the latest and greatest technologies that are being deployed and helping with contact tracing. We have a great lineup of presenters this morning from IBM, Salesforce, and SAS. And after their presentations, we will open the floor for questions from attendees. Should you have any questions throughout the presentation, please submit them in writing via the webinar dashboard under the questions tab. Although we will not be able to take questions live, we will be responding to all questions via email after the presentation. No, we will, I'm sorry, we will be responding to all questions uh, that, that come in right after the presentations. This morning's webinar is being sponsored by NYSAC Excelsior partner, NYSTEC. NYSTEC is a nonprofit technology consulting company advising organizations, agencies, institutions, and businesses since 1996. NYSTEC helps clients plan and manage the acquisition, implementation, and security of their IT systems. They are a trusted partner to government at the state, county, city, and local level, helping their clients achieve real business outcomes. NYSAC has been working closely with NYSTAC, including their president and CEO, Mike Walsh, and the account executive, Bill Cunningham, for several years now on ways to help counties and the state address some of the most challenging information needs, including cybersecurity and election reforms, among many others. For more information on NYSTEC, please visit nystec.com. That's nystec.com. Thank you to NYSTEC. Now, I would like to turn the presentation over to our first speaker, Mary Alice Hunt from IBM. Mary Alice, is certified in COVID-19 contact tracing by the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. She is a strategic and management consultant to government agencies that are experiencing challenges in delivery of technology solutions to the residents who need those services. In addition, she is an expert in design of human services and labor solutions related to delivery of benefits and services to government agency clients across the nation. Mary Alice, we are looking forward to learning from you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you and good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, in addition to my background that uh, was just spoken about, um, I'm a New Yorker. Um, I'm born on Long Island and I live just north of Albany in Saratoga County. So I'm especially pleased to be presenting to you today. Um, as was mentioned, my background in government goes back over 20 years with special focus and programs that help get benefits and services to people, especially in times of personal crisis or public disasters. So with that focus today, I'd like to make you familiar with just a few of the solutions that IBM has been using recently with counties, universities, and school districts to address some of the critical problems posed by COVID. The first I'd like to talk about is IBM's work with applying analytics to these problems. As many of you may be familiar with the fact that there's so many different sources of data that are out there associated with the problems that are facing COVID, the problems that are facing communities. Um, in New York alone, we have a variety of different systems that are capturing information about the cases and the folks who are suffering from COVID or are impacted by having to be quarantined. So, you know, you have things like Eclairs, the, the electronic clinical laboratory reporting system, you know, the information that all feeds into the health commerce system, the information from New York City that comes in over the provider access line or New York City Med, um, you know, all that information that's in New York uh, City Reporting Central. All these different sources of data, you know, provide information that can really be critical to communities in trying to determine how to deploy limited resources in order to have the most impact for managing health and safety. So with that in mind, Watson Analytics provide, uses tools to bring all that data together into useful dashboard, dashboards 
in order to present information that's useful to counties, to school districts, to universities um, in trying to minimize the risk of spread in the community. Um, this includes not only our population analytics and artificial intelligence tools, but also monitoring tools for monitoring, testing, and tracing. And those things we integrate with mobile solutions to support tracing quarantine and isolation. So things like you hear about often about mobile apps, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But in addition to that, we do do um, also customer and client facing websites for responsive county websites with chatbots and tools like that, that allow people to ask questions without having to call in and take time away from resources who are currently actively working with cases. Um, those responsive websites are able to be used on any level of, of mobile device. So your phone, your tablet, you know, your computer, um, which then minimizes the need to be able to have a particular type of technology downloaded onto your phone in order to work with um, the information that's trying to be shared. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of the sort of analytics that we do. So for example, we can bring disparate data sources together associated with different cases. Um, here you have a, a map of my local town, Clifton Park here in, in Saratoga County. Um, and we're able to take information about the uh, cases that are currently um, active with COVID, map the information about you know, where's their home, where's their work, sort of draw a corridor or a line between those two on the right-hand side, but also map all the different places that they've been during the time we think they've been infectious. That can be incorporated then uh, mapped with other uh, individuals who have our active cases or other contacts or potential contacts that we're tracing in order to see where we might have a hotspot or where we might have an outbreak. So maybe I've discovered the fact that the local Chipotle or the local subway, um, you know, has a number of people who have recently been in the restaurant and we may want to actively reach out to them in order to have them disinfect or take actions with their employees for testing. So these are some of the ways that we can bring together uh, the different data sources into actionable information. Next slide, please. The other thing that we do is, um, and this is an example of something we did for um, a state um, and bringing information together across the state into county level information um, in order to identify, use Medicaid roles to identify vulnerable populations and people who are at risk um, of having the most severe uh, reactions to uh, in a COVID infection. So, for example, we can identify members with one, two, or three chronic or more chronic conditions, um, identify members who are living in congregate care settings, such as nursing facilities or those who are in supervised shelters, homeless, uh, uh, homeless shelters, or working with some of our uh, providers in halfway houses, things like that, to identify those who are most at risk and try to drill down into that information to see where we could potentially target um, some of our outreach and some of our protective measures in order to prevent uh, the infection from uh, infiltrating that particular community. So these are just a couple of examples of analytics that we've uh, done recently related to COVID um, that might also help uh, counties as well. Go on to the next slide, please. Moving on to talk about some of the other tools that we bring to bear. Um, we have something called Watson Works, which is actually a series of different solutions that we've brought together in order to provide software, data, artificial intelligence services um, to address the crisis, working with looking at uh, workplaces, looking at schools, looking at community areas for reentry. So we're trying to identify early those who might uh, expose others uh, to COVID um, and managing the risks so that we can return to work and return to school um, with confidence and be able to monitor it on an ongoing basis. So for example, we have tools that allow you to do work and school reentry to make informed decisions about you know, is it safe for workers to return to the workplace? You know, can we keep a business open? Can we keep a school open um, so that students and faculty and staff can return to and remain at school as well and focusing on their health? We have tools that help facilities and people management and safety and wellness. So um, I'll talk to you a little bit in a minute about our ability to not only track and support contact tracing that may be going on within an organization like think of a university or a large school campus, um, to make sure that we're tracking, you know, potential exposures there, but also technologies that allow us to check temperature, um, provide access to buildings based upon your health status. So, for example, you can have a mobile app that basically I have to check in on my temperature and it won't give me the uh, QR code or the, uh, the code to be able to enter the building if I didn't pass my health check that morning. Um, and then also supporting contact tracing and care management. I'm going to talk in more detail about what we call Watson Care Manager there in just a moment. Next slide, please. 
So to support county residents, businesses, schools, and staff to protect their health and safety as school and work reopens, we have a number of different solutions we bring to bear. I'm just going to talk about two of them. One is what we call our Return to Workplace Advisor, which is a mobile app that's being used in communities and schools to help allow people to communicate their self-reported symptoms, as well as any test results they may have to staff, to initiate the contact tracing and case management process, potentially even before we've gotten the official notification from a Department of Health for example, of a test result um, that we need to follow up on. Um, we can also help them by pushing information out to them to coordinate status and next steps for accessing testing and medical care resources in the community. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. And then also just managing and tracing those COVID-19 positive community members. And that we use our case management system, IBM Watson Care Manager. That allows me to have scripted questions that my contact tracers can go through and can ask questions to assess individuals who are either already reported as positive um, or to get the information about the potential contacts they've had and then follow up with those as well. It also provides a whole planning feature that's associated with identifying the services that I need to be able to provide to them to keep them in their you know, place of quarantine or place of isolation. So supporting their health and social needs that they may have. Next slide, please. So an example of this is, for example, we have a family, Susan and Jack, um, who are our parent and local student in the community. Um, and each night, maybe Susan goes into the community app and she checks on the status of the school to make sure that the school's open, there's no outbreak at the school that's causing it to be closed, um, and receive any notifications that may be coming from the county and the community about what's going on in the community and sharing information about you know, current outbreaks or things like that, um, so that she has confidence in her community and her school before she sends Jack. But then the next day, Jack or Susan on his behalf may log into the community app to not only review the local conditions again, but document his health conditions. So she takes his temperature and reports the fact that he's not running a temperature, he has no symptoms. So he gets a green pass on his mobile device to attend classes at his school. Now one morning, let's say Jack identifies the fact that he feels ill and he uses the app to report his symptoms. He would then get a red card from school and would be advised where to go for testing. That red card could then pass information to a county manager, to a school manager, to notify them of a student with a potential symptom or exposure. Now, it may not be so serious, and it depends upon your policy, whether or not you would immediately begin any actions based upon that, but she would work with the school to evaluate that response and use a dashboard of information. I talked to you a little bit about analytics you know, before. Use a dashboard of that information to monitor the community for any new information as well. Jack and Susan go to the local testing site. They test positive. Now those results are sent to the Community Command Center, and now Jill is actively using Watson Care Manager in order to provide care uh, contact tracing or work with her contact tracers and review those to monitor trends across the community and make decisions about whether or not that school is staying open um, or needs to take further action for the pot of children within that school. Moving on to the next slide, please. So Watson Care Manager allows us to assess the individual's needs, capture that critical information, also contact impacted contacts and case, uh, sorry, connect impacted contacts and cases to the resources to support their daily needs during quarantine and isolation. This family may need to have food and grocery services, medication delivery, laundry services, health programs provided to them, or you know, Jack may need academic and personal support so that he's able to continue up with his education while he's having to stay in quarantine. Next slide. So Watson Care Manager is our easily configurable solution. We're able to configure, it's not just an out of the box, we're able to configure it to a local community needs to support what's necessary, tie into reporting um, capabilities that I talked about before. It is a mobile responsive and accessible um, solution. So you just need the website. You don't have to have a special app that you download onto your, your phone or things like that in order to work with the contact tracing features available within it. And all of this is HIPAA enabled to make sure we're protecting any personal health data that's being brought in or being shown by being accessed to, you know, let's say Hixney or, you know, the very shiny or the various um, health information exchanges that may be accessible to um, county workers. So moving on to the next slide, please. I just wanted to thank you for your time today. Um, hopefully I've kept under my 12 minutes that I was allocated, um, but I look forward to your questions later on. And we have a number of other solutions that will help um, also with COVID, but these were some of the key ones that we thought would be of most interest to counties, um, to school districts um, and local uh, communities. So thank you again for your time. And thank you very much, uh, Mary Alice from IBM. I appreciate your presentation and we will be back to you uh, shortly uh, during the question and answer period. I would like now uh, to, to turn it over to Salesforce. And we have uh, uh, 
um, two individuals uh, who will be speaking uh, from Salesforce, Mike Berry, um, will introduce uh, Jerry, um, Jerry Conrad, uh, and he will talk about the Salesforce solutions to support counties with contact tracing. Mike. Uh, thank you, Mark, for giving us the opportunity to participate, and thank you uh, for all the participants for your time today. Um, as Mark mentioned, I'm Mike Berry. I'm the account rep at Salesforce. That's part of the team supporting local governments across the Northeast, including uh, the counties in, in, in upstate New York. I'm as he said, I'm joined by my technical car counterpart, Jerry Conrad, um, who will be talking to you a little bit in more detail in terms of our holistic approach to supporting uh, local governments uh, and the reopening and um, recovery phase from COVID-19. And contact tracing is really a, a part of that. And Salesforce, uh, since this uh, pandemic broke out, has really been a leader in helping local governments develop solutions to help reduce the spread and recover from COVID-19. And one of the key solutions in that is, is enhanced contact tracing that ties in um, with testing. Um, one of my other customers, the state of Rhode Island, uh, very early on in this crisis, in, in mid-March, had reached out to Salesforce seeking our help to develop a testing and contact tracing solution. And we had them up and running within about two weeks. Um, so they reached out to us in mid-March and by early April, um, they had uh, a testing platform and contact tracing platform in production. And since then, um, they've tested about a third of their population and their infection rate has dropped from about 18% to just under 2%. And uh, Governor Romando, who's um, been on a number of news outlets, MSNBC and CNBC has testified to the positive impact that we've had in helping them uh, not only stop the spread of COVID, but also in the safe recovery and reopening. So, you know, Rhode Island was just a start. Um, and since, you know, engaging with Rhode Island, we've delivered COVID solutions, including contact tracing to over 20 states, including uh, Massachusetts, Texas, um, and New Hampshire, to name a few. And then a few large cities um, have also adopted our uh, contact tracing platform, including Chicago, city of Austin, and, and New York City, uh, who's actually been live since June 1. Um, they've all adopted Salesforce as their platform for contact tracing. Um, so that's the, the great news. And, Unfortunately, New York State has sort of chosen a different path for tracing, but the good news for all of us is that in working with all these 20 plus local governments across the country, we've identified a set of common solutions that help governments that include contact tracing as part of our broader approach. Helping set the tide of COVID-19, get back to work and real economies and services that uh, local governments deliver. So um, that's what we call our return to work strategy, and it's branded as work.com. And in, in our experience of working with these local governments, like the counties uh, across the state of New York, as we hope to engage with you uh, moving forward, makes us uniquely positioned to help uh, you come up with a more holistic approach to reopening in a way that keeps your employees and those that they interact with safely safe. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry, uh, who will dive a little deeper into uh, our solution and uh, discuss our approach. Uh, Jerry, you want to take it from here? Yep, thanks, Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Conrad. I'm a solution engineer or a, a technical person with Salesforce. And uh, I want to jump into uh, some of our contact tracing use cases. Uh, real quick, this slide is just uh, legalese for uh, always make your buying decisions based on any technology that is uh, currently available and not on any futures. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So real quick, I, I just want to spend 30 seconds uh, explaining to folks that maybe aren't familiar with Salesforce why Salesforce is involved with contact tracing. Uh, I think a lot of people know us in the CRM space, but uh, uh, Mike and myself are part of the Salesforce public sector group. Uh, and Salesforce is very big in public sector and you know, has a lot of solutions beyond uh, you know, sales automation and CRM. So just a real quick overview for people that aren't familiar. Uh, Salesforce was started 20 years ago as a uh, you know, cloud only uh, you know, 
you know, software as a service, platform as a service, subscription-based provider uh, in the CRM space, but they built and architected that on top of a platform of they're all the different technologies you need to build a given solution, mobile workflows, identity management, collaboration tools, all on a multi-tenant cloud. So it's instantly scalable. And as Salesforce evolved, they moved into customer service or case management. That's a lot of what we use for contact tracing. Call centers, uh, another key component of contact tracing. Marketing outreach uh, and uh, email and text automation tools, community portals, all those pieces sort of can go into a contact tracing. And all of those are software as a service that sits on top of Salesforce's platform that could be used to build anything. So if we need to easily configure or change our requirements, Salesforce is a great platform for that. So I've been lobbying to change the name to something less salesy, but uh, they're not listening to me. So uh, next slide, please. So Salesforce got involved uh, early on with some of our states that were already using Salesforce as a platform for call centers, departments of labor, uh, licensing and permitting. And some of those uh, states came to us and said, you know, we'd like to use our platform to build out different applications to help us get back uh, things back to work. And some of the things that we learned in those transitions were there, there needs to be consolidated applications to assess our readiness to get people back into the workplace and to track uh, you know, contact tracing is probably the, the key application that would track readiness and making sure that we're on top of if there is an outbreak that we can alert all uh, parties very quickly and efficiently uh, and not let anything fall through the cracks. So these are all the things we learned as we moved into building out some of these early contact tracing applications uh, when the pandemic hit. Um, the other thing that we started to look at is as we start to move out some of these applications, uh, as we all know, uh, I don't think things are going to go back to 100% normal. Uh, just the way we work, the way we interact with people, the fact that more people are moving towards doing things online uh, so that we don't have to necessarily always be face-to-face. -face. Uh, so we're architecting a lot of our applications with the idea that there's going to be a new normal and a new way to do things. And we want to create more self-service opportunities, not just for our county employees, but for our constituents as well. And then all those things are governed by how do we do these things as safely as possible? So that, and, and, and in a way that we know that things are uh, uh, opened up safely. So let's go to the next slide. So real quick, I do want to talk about our, our first state that went live with contact tracing. Actually, I don't know if they were first, but uh, certainly one of the most vocal uh, and has seen the best successes is Rhode Island. I've also been involved with Massachusetts using Salesforce for contact tracing. Uh, you'll definitely see interviews out there uh, with Governor Raimondo uh, around how they've rolled out contact tracing. But essentially, contact tracing is a customized call center application uh, where we can intake someone who's tested positive or someone who feels they may uh, uh, test positive uh, through various means, through email, through uh, texting, through phone calls, into a call center that then uh, has conversations with that person and does follow up to see who they've been in touch with and then communicate that back to them. So all the things that go along with uh, a traditional call center, like activity tracking and uh, communication tracking and and uh, pulling all those things into a centralized area so that uh, as uh, the case moves through stage to stage, nothing falls through the cracks, that all of the communications around a particular case, uh, a test positive case, uh, can be picked up by, all, by other contact tracers and followed up on, and then ultimately reported on. That, that's what Rhode Island built out uh, early on. Salesforce saw that, and said, this is gonna be something that other states need, that other counties need, that businesses need. Uh, so very early on, our product teams said, this is gonna be something we're gonna to need to do a lot more of uh, in the future. So let's actually you know, very, very quickly turn it into a configurable application that is more turnkey so that other people can do contact tracing. So with that, Salesforce put together a, a suite of sort of back to work applications with contact tracing being the, the uh, sort of the, the lead application 
uh, into an offering that we call work.com. So next slide. So before we jump into that, uh, these are all the pieces that go along with, with contact tracing capturing all the information in the right place, being able to visualize those relationships between, in this particular case, this is contact tracing specifically for employees versus contact tracing for, uh, you know, constituents in a state, but they all follow the same rules. Uh, we want people to be able to self-service report uh, and communicate that they've uh, uh, might be uh, had an interaction and then track all those people that they've interacted with and alert them uh, with a follow-up communication uh, that they uh, potentially have been um, exposed. So all of those things go into our, our centralized contact tracing application. Uh, you know, being able to immediately do follow-up, uh, protecting our employees so that uh, the employees know that if something happens, that they're gonna be immediately alerted and not, um, that there's not gonna be a lag between uh, when they've maybe had an exposure and uh, when they get alerted. And then all of that, rolls up into a workplace command center where uh, if we're using multiple applications like facilities management, employee wellness testing, uh, contact tracing goes into a centralized command center where we can see everything that's going on and where maybe the red spots are where we need to focus in. Whether there's an outbreak at a particular facility, uh, an outbreak with a particular group of employees, you know, that is all sort of exposed uh, from a reporting and analytic standpoint in a centralized place. Uh, next slide. So with that, uh, again, contact tracing was sort of the first thing that we built out and the first thing that our product teams turned into uh, a reusable solution. And they've rolled that into uh, a suite of solutions called work.com that are all focused around getting people back to work uh, without having to sort of custom build or custom code applications. Now, again, all of these need to be usually configured for specific uh, requirements, county by county, state by state. So it's nice to have a platform where we can do those configurations with some clicks and not uh, custom code. Uh, but obviously the goal of the, the suite of pro, uh, uh, offerings is to open our businesses as safely as possible, get people back into the workplace, uh, knowing that they're gonna be safe, uh, maybe changing some of our day-to-day uh, -day work scenarios so that uh, people can do things more online and self-service. Uh, if need be, uh, reskill employees for being able to do jobs differently uh, in this sort of new normal, and then respond to any future crises uh, with this um, sort of template in place. So next slide. So here's just a quick overview of some of uh, the offerings that are part of work.com. Obviously on the far right, contact tracing to, to follow up on any outbreaks uh, was sort of the the impetus of, of creating all of these back to work applications, but some of the other applications that we've seen states and counties sort of pick up on is um, uh, the one I'm working on right now is an employee wellness check, where on a daily basis, a survey goes out to employees to ask how things are going, not just around exposure, but their job in general, so that those surveys can be aggregated on a daily basis to look for uh, you know, exposure problems, but also back to work problems. And that can happen on a regular basis. Um, uh, that can then be automated so that as employees are going back to work, we're, we're checking in with them more regularly in a more automated, more self-service fashion. Uh, shift management and planning, obviously now with uh, not wanting to have big groups of people, uh, automating and, and providing more self-service around facilities management so that people can schedule rooms, in a self-service fashion, so we don't have overlap of employees. There's applications that uh, where we can actually do uh, sort of self-service shift management, uh, facilities management, uh, room scheduling. Uh, my trailhead for learning and wellness is, uh, in a lot of cases, we need to train people on what the new protocols are, and we have a learning platform that can be plugged into all of this to let people uh, sort of take these online trails to get trained up and then get certified so that they can get back into the building. Like if we have particular protocols we want people to follow, we can automate or make that uh, learning path for them self-service. Emergency response management, you know, tracking PPEs and, uh, you know, all of our inventory for things. Uh, we have applications to manage that. We have a lot of states that are actually uh, using us for grants management. So as the, the state or county becomes a grantee, 
they then become a grantor of money out to either businesses or other uh, entities in the community. We have applications that can plug into all of this to manage those grants. Uh, and we have partners that are building out uh, applications on our platform to extend and you know do more of these things uh, sort of across the enterprise. And then of course, in the upper left, everything plugs into a workplace command center. So if you're using one or more of these applications, you can see what's going on across the board. So next slide. So if you want to learn more about work.com, Salesforce is good at documenting what's going on. So just go to work.com. Uh, you can watch uh, a bunch of different uh, uh, vignette demos that are out there about the offerings. Uh, there's a playbook for uh, how, to how to get these and implement them in the quickest way possible. Obviously, your contact for all of this is uh, Mike Berry, who's michael.berry at salesforce.com. Uh, and he can uh, point you to the right place to learn more. And next slide. And of course, thank you for your time today. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, what Salesforce has been doing in, in contact tracing and the space of getting people back to work. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Our final speaker is Steve Bennett, the Director of Global Government Practice at SAS. Steve holds a PhD in Computational Biochemistry from Stanford and is the former director of the National Biosurveillance Integration Center at the US Department of Homeland Security. I'm sure he has quite a few stories from that position. As the global government practice lead for SAS, Steve Bennett is passionate about helping governments around the world put their data to work for the citizens that they serve. Dr. Bennett, thanks for joining us this morning. Great, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me today. Just a quick sound check. Uh, Mark, can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. Fantastic. Okay, next slide, please. So the year was 1854, and a cholera epidemic was ravaging the city of London, and a single neighborhood suffered 550 deaths from cholera in just two weeks. Now, the prevailing theory, as we all know at the time, amongst physicians was that cholera was spreading through the air, that somehow infectious particles were getting into the air and uh, making people sick. But the gentleman on the left, the London physician, John Snow, had other ideas, believing that water could be how cholera was spreading. And as the outbreak unfolded, Snow decided to use data to investigate how the outbreak was spreading. And in that hard-hit neighborhood that had seen those large number of deaths, Snow went door to door and he counted the cholera deaths in each location and he placed them on a now very famous map. Next slide. Here's that map that he drew in the fall of 1854. And if you look at the data, next slide please. You can see that the location of the cholera deaths as a result of his investigation of sick individuals, it was clear that the cholera deaths were all roughly localized or clustered around a single water pump, the Broad Street Pump. Next slide, let me show you where that is. You can see that those deaths cluster there. Uh, Jeanette, one more slide, please. And here's the pump on Broad Street in London today. And uh, what he did is he took that pump out of service. And by taking the pump out of service, he effectively stopped the outbreak. And Jon Snow proved the connection between the outbreak and the water from the Broad Street pump using data. And with that, modern epidemiology was born. Snow was the first to use geolocation and maps to spatially analyze disease. He was the first to interview and compile detailed patient disease records. As imp and importantly, he was the first to synthesize that information into, well, let's call it a risk calculation, and then use that to take public health action to mitigate or slow the spread of disease. And you know, today, these same approaches 170 years later are needed more than ever. And what makes the difference isn't just the collection of data and putting it on a map. Like Snow, what makes contact tracing count in saving lives helping reopen economies, it's the analysis of that data. It's finding patterns and risk and other insights, and then applying those insights to support the very hard decisions that public health has to make every day, and then follow that up with, with real action. Next slide, please. So good morning again. Um, I'm, I'm Steve Bennett. Um, with me is Sarah Newton and Andrew Ball. You heard our, our bios before. Sarah leads our US uh, health policy team, and Andrew directs US public policy for us. And as the global leader in analytics, SAS's mission isn't unlike what Jon Snow did all those years ago. 
transform a world of data into a world of intelligence so that insights buried in our data can be brought to bear to support better and faster decision-making. Next slide, please. Now, we've been doing that in government since the day we opened our doors uh, almost, almost five decades ago. Government was the very first customer that we served way back in 1976, and today, still our second largest industry by revenue. As you can see from the numbers there, we are very much a global company in how we support government, but we also take care of our state and federal governments here in the United States as well. Uh, next slide, specific to the Empire State, uh, we are currently supporting 20 state agencies and authorities in a whole range of areas, uh, helping government put data to work, everything from budget and revenue to mental health to COVID-19 response. Next slide, speaking of COVID response, SAS is supporting a number of governments around the world in the fight against COVID-19. Here are some select examples, um, everything from epidemiological modeling at Cleveland Clinic that, by the way, outperformed leading academic modeling, which helped them make decisions about opening hospital capacity to things like medical resource optimization in Germany, where we helped that country optimally use their ICU beds so that the right patients had the beds when they needed them. Things like benefits delivery programs, helping Brazil, for example, get $55 billion in emergency aid to the right families that needed it quickly. And then situational awareness. So we're doing this in states uh, across the country and countries around the world, making sure that leaders have access to the best information for decision making. But for the balance of our time this morning, let me focus on that last one, which is contact tracing. A couple of select examples there are the governments of Hong Kong and Germany, uh, among others. And so I'd like to talk a little more about our approach to contact tracing and how it relates to public health. Next slide, please. Um, so our, our approach, at the risk of being controversial, is very different from a, a lot of what you may read in the news about a, a smartphone or app-first sort of strategy. For for a bunch of reasons we could get into in the Q&A, we, we don't believe that an app-first strategy is likely to work. If you look at contact tracing, it runs, and we helped coordinate from, from the federal level when I was in government myself, um, contact tracing in, in many places operates the same way it did 90 or 100 years ago. It can often be very manual, often doesn't have a lot of tools. It is very old fashioned in a lot of places. So rather than a technology coming in, a technology company coming in and trying to tell public health how to do public health, uh, our approach is to uh, look at how public health works, work with public health agencies to augment and scale that to make it fit for purpose for COVID-19. And so that's that's the approach that I'll walk you through here. Um, our approach to contact tracing in terms of modernizing and scaling has four pieces to it, and they're modular. Not everybody needs all four pieces. The first is around the data. The contact tracer needs to be able to take data at a very large scale. Many states are hiring tens of thousands of these contact tracers, and that data needs to be organized in a central, what we call a contact database, where that can be cleaned, deduplicated, de-identified if necessary, uh, entity resolved, all those sorts of things you want to do to clean data and connect it together. Now, lots of people are doing number one, um, but when you get to two, three, and four, we see less of that going on in support of public health. The second one, number two there, is around enriched data. Once you have collected contact data, enriching data like passenger data, um, uh, employing employment rosters, uh, data around social determinants of health like the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, a lot of that data can be brought to bear to help augment and enrich the data that we're collecting in classic contact tracing as has been done in public health for many, many years. The third area is intelligent alerting. And this is where we really haven't seen anyone focusing on this. Um, even if you had all that data pulled together and highly enriched, you don't wanna to have to manually continue to search through that to find the things that you need to take action on. It would be great if the system automatically figured out where your risks were and then alerted you to new risks emerging so you could take quick action. So that's our third component. And fourth, analytics-derived insights so that public health officials can make the right sorts of policy and public health uh, pronouncements and decisions that um, best reduce risk for their, for their communities. Next slide, please. And here's just a little more, I won't spend a lot of time here, again, so some of the bits and pieces in each of those four pieces. Being able to build the database and establish links and connections, um, enriching data with other sorts of links, intelligent alerting around recommended actions, and um, sending those alerts to the right people at the right time. And then the public health insights, I will say a little more here. Um, not just figuring out who needs to quarantine, but where should we test next? Who is most likely to spread the virus? Where do I find linkages between patients that I know must be there, but I can't find them, like what we saw in the, the South Korea projects from uh, several months ago. Uh, what communities are at greatest risk, and are my policies working? Are we seeing 
social distancing working and do I need to make changes in those policies? So all of this is built around not being a technology first approach, but being a public health approach first that uses technology. And it's, it's, it's subtle difference, but an important one. Next slide, please. So a little more about some of the public health insights there, uh, being able to identify susceptible populations, as I mentioned. I mentioned epidemiological modeling for decision-making, which can sit underneath this, and then risk modeling to identify uh, vulnerable populations. With well, the couple minutes I have left, next slide, please, Jeanette. I want to talk you through a couple of screenshots of how the solution uh, how the solution works, and I want to do that in um, in the form of two um, two personas: a case investor, case investigator, or epidemiolo epidemiologist. You might have those questions there, looking for hidden patterns of risk, prioritizing deployment of testing or PPE, and then the new, uh, let's say a New York health policy analyst or a lead epidemiologist, which is uh, maybe interested in the broader questions uh, here that she might be worried about. Where are we, do we have emerging hotspots? Where are there micro segments in New York jurisdictions where we might need to take different decisions? Um, where can we understand the, the impacts of different social determinants for protection of historically underserved communities and others? So again, a public health first sort of approach based on these two critical personas. So over the next couple slides, I'm gonna walk you through a story. You can go to advance, Jeanette. And this is the story of a fictional person. Her name is Danielle Davidson. And she has been, uh, she's tested positive. And this is what our, our initial dashboard might look like if you are a case investigator or an epidemiologist. You might have a list of assigned tasks or contact interviews to conduct. And again, this is pretty commonplace. A lot of different solutions will do this. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about this. You can think of this as the data collection, data entry for the contact tracer. We have a mobile interface to this. So if you're a contact tracer in a hospital, you can pull open your phone. You don't even need an app. It'll work on any HTML5 browser, and you can put the data in direct from your interview in a hospital. But I won't say a whole lot here. Let's get to the next slide, which focuses on the initial connection of data. And this happens automatically. Uh, normally, a contact tracing team might have to build these networks um, manually. The system does this in the contact tracing database for you. You can see Daniel Davidson there in the middle. And we've identified a, a set of connections that she's got in the system. We know that she's associated with uh, a senior care home called Hazelwood Care Facility. It's a it's a nursing home, and she's associated with that because her mother, Rachel Davidson, is a patient there. So that's already a concern that we've got a positive test for someone who may be connected to uh, a high risk facility. Next slide, please. And when you continue to open up the network diagram, you can see that there are a number of other individuals that are in our system as having positive tests. Those blue icons, uh, positive tests associated with that nursing home. Hazelwood Care, one of them, just for just for the, fo the purposes of this short demo, if you take that one in the upper right, Damon Derrick, he's an employee, part-time uh, hourly employee at Hazelwood Care. Next slide, please. And if you look at Damon, you can see that he's got a lot of connections that concern us as well. Not only is he an employee of that initial care home that we talked about, Hazelwood, but he's also a part-time employee, a second job at another senior care home called Glendale Senior Care. And that worries us because if this person's positive, he could be a spreader to high-risk communities. In addition, he's also connected to a quick service restaurant where he's got a third job. This is a common pattern we see for some low-wage um, you know, low employees at uh, nursing homes. So we think that this might be a pattern of concern for us. Um, next slide. But here's where the analytics comes in. Um, building the networks is great, but I don't want to have to automatically look for those patterns when my contact tracing data gets big, maybe tens of thousands of people in it. So what you can do in the system is build a general, uh, what we call it a sub-network that represents a risk pattern of concern. In this case, a, per a person, that contact trace there, you know, Damon Derrick in this case, and the fact that he's connected to three locations of concern, let's say those two nursing homes and a quick service restaurant. You can build this pattern generally and then search for that small pattern across the entire network that you've built in our SaaS solution. And um, getting a little nerdy here on the computer science, uh, our, our pattern matching algorithm runs faster than anybody. It runs eight times faster than the, the current market leader, a company called Neo4j that does graph analytics. So we do this very, very fast, even for very large networks, so that somebody can say, hey, I've got a pattern I'm worried about, somebody connected to multiple nursing homes. I wanna look for that in all of my data so that I can get ahead of potential concerns and again, take public health action. And even better, even better than looking for this pattern is setting the system to alert you on it. You can set a flag for this pattern so that anytime new data being entered all day long by these contact tracers all over the county, anytime that data matches this pattern, it'll flag and send you an alert so that you know you've got an emerging known pattern of risk that you're, that you're concerned about. Next slide. 
And I'll skip this one. This is just what those search results look like. When you do the search, in this example, we found three other examples of this high-risk pattern inside, inside the system. Next slide, please. So what do you do with all that for that other, uh, at the other persona, the health policy analyst at the high level? Again, looking for hot spots and emerging clusters, being able to take all of that contact tracing data, pull it together and score it for risk to understand in my county or in my state, where do I see my prioritization of my risks for different locations going up or down? So I know where I need to take different actions and where I might need to assign contact tracers or other staff where I see that I'm starting to be overwhelmed. Next slide. I mentioned micro segmentation already. That's really important because contact tracing, we know that our communities are not uh, homogenous, that every county has different communities with different risk factors. So it's important to be able to use the contact tracing data, not just to draw a pretty network, but to do analytics, to identify zip codes where we think there's a risk in the next seven days so that you can get ahead of things, make better strategic decisions about next steps. Maybe I need to slow the reopening or shut down in County A, but not County B because of my understanding of what's going on based on the micro segmentation. So if you, if, if you miss everything, the point here is to be able to provide quality decision support to help public health officials make the hard decisions they're faced with every day, particularly in an event like COVID-19. Okay, next slide, we'll just one or two more here. Um, so we'd love to work with you. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, um, that you've probably seen in the presentation here is that, um, you know, we're a technology company, we love our technology, um, but that's the, the exact wrong order in which to tackle a problem like this. We are domain focused first. So we have a team of epidemiologists, people like myself who, who've worked in public health and government, SAS health policy experts and others who lead the use of technology to solve real public health problems. And then of course the technology track, we've got to get the science right as well. And so our view is that to get something like contact tracing right, you've got to do both right. You've got to have the right domain understanding to work with the public health community, and you've got to have the right technology to help solve those sorts of problems. Um, so with that, on the last slide, Jeanette, I will wrap it up. I know my colleague Andrew wanted to just uh, say a few words about our connections with NISAC, and, uh, and then we'll, I think, transition to, to, um, to Q&A. So Andrew, over to you. Yes, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Mark and Jeanette, and everyone at NYSEC. Um, you know, we at SAS are very uh, thankful and excited uh, at the opp potential opportunity to work with you all. Um, you know, we have we have, as Steve mentioned, um, a lot of my colleagues uh, who are prepared um, and are eager to get to work here. Myself, um, I have, I came to SAS recently. I spent 10 years working in the executive chamber in New York, uh, in Governor Cuomo's office, um, and I've spent a lot of time working at the local level with many of you. Um, and Steve and Mark and NYSEC, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to the opportunity to work with you guys um, even more in the future. So thank you, Mark and Jeanette, and turn it back over to you guys. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve, I really appreciate the history lesson of uh, epidemiology. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so thank you for bringing that context into today's presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. And at this uh, point, I would like to ask any attendees or all of our attendees, if you have a question, please write it into the question portion of the dashboard and we will get to those questions as they come in. Uh, to start, I'd like to start uh, back with uh, Mary Alice from IBM. Uh, Mary Alice, you are a certified contact tracer. Can you talk about how your technology or these technologies interface or intersect with the certification, the Bloomberg um, um, Health School certification? Sure. Well, one of the things that I did, I, I went through the certification really because I wanted to make sure that I understood um, what you know contact tracers really were going through and how they had to do their work um, in order to make sure that our solutions were matching up. Um, you know, we have a number of solutions that have been in existence for years, this being one of them, which is really geared towards helping those who are impacted by a variety of barriers um, that they may be facing. So care management is used, um, as many may know, you know, for example, in the Department of Health for health homes and addressing those who have multiple chronic conditions um, in New York State um, and being able to get services and benefits out to them in a timely manner. It's used with homeless services to create plans of care, you know, in New York City for making sure that individuals are able to get, you know, the resources that they need to help hopefully get them independent and safely in a home again. 
So trying to make sure that those solutions uh, you know, traveled well, I'll call it, to contact tracing, and making sure that we were adding in features associated with you know, the very critical needs that they need to be able to identify the differences between a case and a potential contact and the different care levels that they need. So for example, we're able to support those isolation supports that may be necessary for somebody who's an active case, as well as the regular sort of check-ins and things like that that are necessary, not only with your, your, your active cases, but also with those who are potential contacts who you now may, may be asking to quarantine and the different supports that they need to stay at home. I mentioned a few of them, but one of the things that I learned through going through the contact tracing training was the fact that you may have a household that has somebody who's infected and typically they might be infected, let's say in an average case for about two weeks that they're infectious to others. But if you have somebody else in the home like a spouse or a partner um, who's there, their first day that they need to start quarantine or continuing their quarantine is the last day of infection for that individual um, who was an active case. So that whole entire household of just two people may be continuing to have to be provided supports for up to a month, if not more, depending upon the infectious period. And that became a very big um, thing we, we identified for uh, governments that they weren't necessarily aware of that these supports needed to provide for such a length of time. So our solutions really are geared towards trying to help not only with the identification and tracing, but also with the ongoing care. That's uh, really a great point. Thank you. And 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 that's right. Counties are there. Um, uh, we are uh, enforcing quarantines. We are supporting those individuals who have tested positive, and we are are conducting the contact tracing. So, again, I want to just uh, shout out uh, our appreciation. To, um, to all of you who, who spoke today, IBM, SAS, and Salesforce, for coming up with solutions that are supportive of our counties as we are going through these processes. And ultimately, you know, we're doing this to stem the spread of COVID-19, uh, to make our communities safer and more healthy. So thank you. Um, I do have a question. We have multiple technology solutions uh, that counties are, are are having to vet or uh, consider whether or not we want to um, uh, deploy in order to support contact tracing, testing, uh, or any other uh, public health um, um, challenge that we're all facing through this COVID-19 pandemic. How do these, these technologies, how can um, counties deploy these technologies and work hand in hand together. So can uh, Nassau County and Suffolk County choose two different uh, contract contact uh, tracing technologies and, and have it work uh, across borders? So I'll kick that over to, um, to uh, Jerry in, in, uh, for Salesforce. What are your thoughts on that, Jerry? Yeah, no, so that, that's a great question. And uh, I've been around in the technology space to remember when data interoperability was super hard. And uh, luckily, I think because of you know customer needs, it's gotten a lot easier. So uh, I've worked and done integrations with you know uh, different applications from IBM and SaaS. And I think the way the world is going is most platforms, uh, technologies, are designed to sort of play ni more nicely with each other, whether it's uh, open RESTful APIs or integrations to, you know, uh, enterprise service buses to be able to transfer data back and forth or messaging platforms. Um, it's just a lot easier now for developers to sort of connect applications together. So in the past where I would immediately not even want to talk about doing integrations nowadays, those can be part of a, a you know a sprint uh, so you know definitely don't it, it's worth at least exploring how to do those integrations because the technology uh, has has gotten a lot easier and better for developers to do those integrations so it's it's no longer a, an impediment so absolutely okay great um, so um, uh, for SAS for Steve um, you you get this data. Uh, and you have that for the four point, could you go over the, the, the four points uh, um, that you discussed before? And then uh, you get the data from the contact tracers and, and, and walk through the process again uh, for you, for how um, your solution works. Yeah, sure. So those four pieces were around collection of the data, 
that could happen, you know, back home in the public health office or remote via, a, you know, mobile mobile device entry. And that data, you know, depending on what country you're in or what county you're in or what state you're in, that data could follow the CDC guidelines for how you collect and organize that information. That information, the contact database is automatically um, entity resolved and connected with the other data you've already got in there from other contact tracers. That second step was then enriching data to the extent you have access to it or wanted to use it, social vulnerability data, uh, travel manifest data or airline data, whatever, other data that can enrich that data set. That's kind of the second step. The third piece is then alerting, intelligent alerting based on patterns in that data. And then the fourth piece was uh, how do you take all of that, pull it together and build analytics derived insights? Um, because just a comment at risk of getting on the soapbox, right? The, the whole point of all of this is to help somebody make a decision, right? Somebody, a, a senior leader or a lead epidemiologist has to make a decision. Do I advise the governor to do X or Y? Do I uh, advise quarantine for this person? There are decisions. And so our, our advice is to start with the decisions and work backwards and see what technology best serves the decision rather than, hey, here's some technology, let's find a way to use it. And so that's why we've kind of built this in a modular way. Um, we think those analytics derived insights are critical because those are the things that at the end of the day help somebody make those hard decisions with a little bit more evidence than maybe they had yesterday. Well, great. We're at the uh, one hour mark. I, I thank you all. Thanks. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, Steve and SAS and Jerry and Salesforce and Mary Alice and IBM uh, and everybody who helped to put this this uh, webinar together. Thank you, Jeanette Stanziano, the NYSEC Director of Education and Training. And one more shout out uh, um, to NYSTEC. Uh, thank you for sponsoring this webinar this morning. And thank you to our member county officials who joined us this morning uh, to, to learn more about contact tracing technologies and how they can help counties stem the spread of COVID-19. I hope you all have a, a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.